Looking to provide your school or organization with high quality audio products at affordable prices? Andreas Communications specializes in designing microphones, headsets, USB adapters, webcams, and more to ensure online reliable communication. Their EDU series of products are built to withstand the rigors of classroom usage. Andreas Communication partners with iTutor to provide an exclusive discount for Learning Can't Wait listeners of 40% off their noise canceling headsets. Head to https colon forward slash forward slash andreacommunications.com forward slash iTutor forward slash today to access this limited offer. IPVO is making online learning simple for educators and students alike. Their affordable and lightweight document cameras let teachers simply plug and play to share anything. Homework, live demos, PowerPoints, videos, and more from anywhere. Compatible with any device, teachers can make the most of their document cameras with creative filters, time lapses, stop motion, and more through IPVO's free software, Visualizer. IPVO and iTutor have partnered to provide a 20% discount to all Learning Can't Wait listeners. Visit IPVO.com forward slash iTutor to upgrade your technology today. Welcome to the Learning Can't Wait podcast, an iTutor production. At iTutor, our vision is to ensure every child has access to education, regardless of circumstance. Each episode, we will be joined by pathfinders within and around the education space who are bringing about transformational change on behalf of deserving students. I am your host, Haley Spierbauer. Welcome back, everybody, to today's episode of the Learning Can't Wait podcast. Today's guest is an incredible leader in the ed tech space. I'm so excited to introduce to you Bart Epstein. Bart is the founder and former CEO of the Ed Tech Evidence Exchange, the former CEO of UVA, University of Virginia's Ed Tech Accelerator Venture Fund, and the former general manager of the U.S. Department of Defense's online tutoring and homework help service powered by ed, by tutor.com. I am so excited to have Bart here today. He is also serving on the board of ISTE and ASCD um, and recently was named one of the top 100 influencers to follow by EdTech Digest and was named EdTech Magazine's list of 30 K-12 influencers to follow. Bart, welcome to today's <laughs> episode. Hey, Ellie, it's wonderful to be with you. You know what the wild part about that introduction is? I had to cut things out. <laughs> that just means I'm getting old. Well, that or you've made a really big impact on this space in your time being here. Let's look at it that way. Deal. Deal. Bart, I'm so happy you're joining me today on, on today's episode. As you know, uh, EdTech is rapidly evolving and being in ed tech myself as or experiencing ed tech first as a teacher then as a school leader and now in the ed tech space um there's so much learning that has happened for me and i imagine for all of our listeners i'm so excited for you to share your own perspectives with everybody in the audience today sure let's dig in let's dig in so so how did you come to be the professional and personal version of yourself that's a great question I believe that every kid deserves a chance to thrive and that we should be collectively ashamed that the richest country in the history of the world is doing such an uneven job of supporting our students. I think of myself as an impatient innovator who doesn't like excuses and who sees how important structural incentives are and barriers. Um, previously, I worked in a daycare center for homeless kids. And in college, I actually created my own major studying poverty and discrimination. And I just have seen firsthand how awful and unfair it is when kids who are brilliant and want to learn aren't given the tools and support that they need. And I think that changing structures in our education system is really, really hard. But using technology to support teaching and learning is a 
a, a very powerful way to provide those kids with more support. And so that's part of the reason that I am so deeply enmeshed in the world of ed tech. Given that I haven't finalized the title for today's episode, impatient innovator is maybe my favorite term I've ever heard. And it might wind up with the moniker for today's episode. But you have to be impatient. Like as a fellow, like somewhat angry consumer of where we are as a country and educating our youth equitably, I I understand your impatience. How does it how does it really play out for you, your, that impatience? Like what does that look like in your career? Mm-hmm. So my career has gone back and forth between entrepreneurship, social justice, education, and also law, which is a thread that ties a lot of this stuff together. And uh, I had the honor of serving as the law clerk to the chief judge of the United States Court of Appeals in San Diego, which is the last stop before the United States Supreme Court. And I just found that project, that that whole experience infuriating because people who have the resources, corporations who have done wrong, they can delay justice for people for five or seven or nine years by tying things up in the court. And so I had the saying on the wall over my desk, justice delayed is justice denied. And That's how I feel about education. And it's even more critical in education because kids only get one chance to learn math in fifth grade. And if they don't get taught properly, then they may never even attempt algebra, which we know is the most important gateway class towards college and career success. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. I mean, there's so many ways to attack this particular issue. Uh, the legal policy end of it is one. The like structural systemic end of it from an education perspective is another. Sounds like you've done a bit of all of it. And, you know, I like a good rabble rouser. So excited to talk more about that. But before we jump into the rabble rousing, when you reflect on your own schooling, what moments stand out to you as transformative as a learner? So like a lot of kids, I got good grades in elementary school and in middle school, and then things started getting difficult. And I remember my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Adams, harping on us that we need to have focus on both speed and accuracy. One without the other was not meeting his needs. And That really set the tone for me for my high school career of always wanting to rush through my homework, but realizing that there's no point in rushing through it if I didn't understand it. Another really key moment for me was later in law school at the University of Virginia, where my constitutional law professor, Mike Klarman, uh, a brilliant scholar, he changed my mind on something big. And... Uh, Without getting into the details of it, um, it was about the right to die and whether I should have the right to die. And I went into that class thinking, of course, I should have that right. Why should I be forced to suffer uh, at the end of my life if I can make the decision? And he got me to understand the importance of understanding other people's perspectives. And I know that may sound simplistic, but I'm me, you're you. We, you know, it's hard for us to imagine being somebody else, but the reality is if I am given the right to choose to die, it forces the decision on millions of other people who may not have the same life situation and might be subject to pressure from their families or an insurance company or somebody unseemly. That's really stuck with me and um, I think has helped me in my career as I learn to better empathize with people who not only have different life trajectories and experiences and priorities and values, but may disagree with me and be right. In an overly reductive way, it sounds like you really learned how to think from both those folks. 
right? I like did. how to think and how to act. And really, when you think about education, so many people conflate learning with memorization of information, but really what learning should be is learning how to think and how to act and navigate the world. So hats off to Michael Klarman and Mr. Adams, who sound like they really imparted that on you. Yes. You know, now you may have teachers that take different forms. And I'm wondering where today you kind of look for, for that type of inspiration for driving you forward and keeping you enthused and engaged in the work that we're about to dig into and learn more about. Yeah, it's a great question. And there are numerous people who inspire me individually with their tenacity. Um, Unfortunately, many of them get up really early in the morning and I aspire to get up early in the morning, Haley, but it's just not going to happen. There was an article about that in, I don't know who, this morning, no joke. And my husband leaned over and was like, do you see this? And this was as our kids were jumping in our bed being like, are we time for breakfast? I was like, we are not those people. (laughs) We are not. So shout out to Allison Griffin, my good friend who gets up at 5 a.m. That's not me. Uh, the, The kind of inspiration that motivates me now is more about innovation and how to have it reach the most people. And in my career, I have worked with and supported many people with excellent ideas that don't scale. And scaling is really, really important. If you're running a nonprofit that's helping 100 people, well, that's great for those 100 people. But if you can find a way to make your nonprofit into a for-profit that then provides the nearly identical service to a million people, and it's sustainable, and it has different tiers of cost so that people who care about premium services can subsidize those who pay nothing. Uh, that's That's a really impressive model. Uh, Back when I was uh, a lawyer in private practice at one of the largest law firms in the world, I was a volunteer at the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. And many of my clients were homeless who I couldn't reach by phone. They didn't have a phone. And I was trying to set up doctor's appointments, meetings with the VA, social security uh, appeals, and I couldn't. So I negotiated a deal with one of the largest telecom providers in the world to provide free voicemail boxes to every homeless person in Washington, D.C. And the one condition that completely caught me off guard was I had to agree to keep it secret. (laughs) And this was 20 years ago, back when voicemail was new and a big deal. They didn't want publicity they were not interested in being inundated by everybody who wanted free voicemail for their worthy project. And so eventually voicemail became more pervasive and more accessible. And back around the turn of the millennium, I don't know if you remember, but email used to cost money. If you wanted an email address, You had to sign up for AOL or somebody else and pay them. And then Gmail came along and made it free for the entire world. And Google didn't do that for the purpose of helping a billion people who couldn't afford email, but it did. And that has transformed that has transformed how people communicate in, in many good ways. And so an example of how I see that affecting our world in education is that tutoring, which is a big part of my background, used to require two people to be in the same place. And this made it very complex and expensive. When I was a young tutor, getting paid a lot of money to go to people's houses in Georgetown and Northern Virginia. It took me, you know, 45 minutes to drive someplace, park and walk to their house and sit down at the table. I would tutor kids once a week for, I don't know, an hour and a half or two hours. 
And it was impossible back then for me to just show up at their house for eight minutes when they were doing their homework and stuck on something. But now we can use technology to have tutors online connect with no appointment or with no travel. And that is something that is scaling into our education space right now in a way that is potentially transformative, not only for tutoring, but as we'll get to later, for teachers who are currently trapped in whichever geography they reside. And they're limited to being able to teach only in the places where they can drive to. And I think we're on the verge of a revolution that can set teachers free that we can talk about more later. Yeah, let's do that. Let's talk about that. I think, you know, as I'm listening to you share about what inspires you today, it, you name scalability. And for me, it's, it could easily be interpreted by someone who functions in the business world as like this scalability for profit, um, which is always an aspect of it, right? You know, businesses exist to make money. That is a fact. Um, But when you're talking about education, there's this other like tenor that comes through, which is scalability for good. How do we reach more people and quickly? And education has been really, well, actually, let me ask you, what is the status of education today? If you were going to give a state of the union, what an ed tech specifically, what would you share? Well, it's a great question, but I can't let your previous comment go uncommented on. Of course, of course. Go back to it. We'll come back to the state of the union. So education is a unique part of our society. And some people think it's too important to leave to for-profit entities. And I think that's just crazy. I I don't go to a, a nonprofit surgeon to have my spine operated on. The brakes of my car aren't done by a nonprofit collective. I get my food that I eat and put in my children from farmers who farm for profit and sell to wholesalers who are responsible for quality who and freshness who deliver to retailers. For-profit companies and non-profit companies and government organizations each have strengths and weaknesses. And understanding how to manage them and how to oversee them and how to guard against their risks and their excesses is tremendously important. And I have talked to hundreds of school superintendents, and I believe that arguably the most important person in any school district is the person whose job it is to negotiate contracts with for-profit companies, whether they be the ones who deliver food or provide security or do professional development or provide tutoring support or textbooks or assessments, for-profit companies are relatively easy to understand and to motivate and to monitor. They do what you give them an incentive to do. And many of the things that have gone wrong with for-profit education are entirely foreseeable. We could do all another episode. You could be any scandal. And as I have said uh, in other places before, if you go to the zoo and you drop your ham sandwich into the tiger cage and the tiger eats your ham sandwich, it's not the tiger's fault. That's what (laughs) tigers do. And if a state signs a contract with a company that says, we'll pay you a dollar for every pen that you hand out to students. You should expect that company to do everything possible to hand out pens to every single student. If there's no limit on how many pens they can hand out, kids are going to get a hundred pens each. You have to structure your contracts carefully and thoughtfully. And 
on the flip side of that, government monopolies like local school districts have strengths and weaknesses. They have the benefit of having all of the kids in a local community or almost all of them going to the school, but they have the downside of knowing that kids have virtually no other option, which takes away their structural incentive to improve in the face of competition. So I am not an absolutist when it comes to for-profit education or charter schools, but I do think that it's very important that we understand that just because education is important doesn't mean that the best way to do all parts of it is through government or through nonprofits, even though government and nonprofits have outstanding advantages that we should all leverage. So rant aside. Yeah, well, but that's a good, that's a really important distinction you're making. And maybe we will do a whole nother episode on that because I think that a lot of folks in education don't fully understand for profits. And I say that as my experience. So like this is again, not an absolutism. This isn't everyone. I didn't fully understand for profit until I started working in one. And really, you know, education, there's almost like a stigma against for profit agencies within school buildings. And Mm -hmm. some of that may come from a lack of understanding and a lack of knowledge about how to leverage. It's it's funny you say that the most important person is that person who negotiates Mm -hmm. the contracts because some of the understanding probably gets lost there. Most folks don't understand what that takes or why that's important or, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one more quick story that really opened my eyes. So when I was um, younger, I had a friend who was an aspiring meteorologist and I learned about their world. You want to go be a meteorologist, you work at the, you know, a remote TV station and for a couple of years, and then you move up the Nielsen rankings. And, you know, over the course of 10 years, you may move five times, slowly getting into bigger markets, proving yourself. And so I was at an event a number of years ago where I met the person who was in charge of procurement for Chicago public schools. And I was really interested to hear his story. And I said, well, tell me, you know, where did you go to get your master's degree in procurement science? And what were all the school districts where you worked, uh, you know, a 5,000 kid district and then a 20,000 kid district, you know, that you got this incredible job? And he said, Bart, what are you talking about? I worked in the mayor's office and the mayor said, do you want to run transportation or procurement? And I thought, I probably can't kill anybody in procurement. (laughs) (laughs) And he said to the mayor, I'm not qualified to do either thing. And the mayor said, go meet the people who are doing both of those jobs right now and tell me what you think. And he reported that he came back a week or two later and said, I can't believe I'm more qualified than both of them, but I'll take the procurement job. And this was many years ago. And I'd like to think that something has changed. But the reality is a lot of school districts, especially large ones, are subject to political pressures related to oversight. School districts are mostly managed by local school boards of elected people, many of whom have no experience with education, some of whom have a particular niche issue axe to grind, others who are just looking to pad their resume as they run for state legislature. And that's a really, really difficult environment for school superintendents to be managed by a group of people that changes frequently and has very different competing interests. You know, this is not what happens in for-profit. In for-profit, there's almost never a mystery about it. Your board of directors are made up of investors. Your investors want you to make money. They almost always want you to make money ethically and in ways that are sustainable, but Pleasing them is pretty straightforward. And in education, it's not that way. And 
I, th I think it's very important that we understand, for example, that the work I led over the last four or five years building the nonprofit EdTech Evidence Exchange was focused on helping schools make better decisions, trying to get them to understand which EdTech tools are most likely to be a good fit for their local environments. And there is no nonprofit equivalent in the world of supermarkets. There's no nonprofit out there trying to convince supermarkets to buy the best freezers for their local stores because that information is already available in the free market. And the people who manage supermarkets already have all the incentives needed to buy the right freezers. If you own a supermarket and you buy the wrong freezer and it doesn't work well and it melts the food and it wastes food and customers get sick, that's a disaster for you. You're going to you're going to get sued. You're going to get fines from the government. Your insurance is going to go up. You're going to lose customers. You're going to lose profit. You're going to lose money. But meanwhile, in education, if a school district that's completely overwhelmed with thousands of things that need doing, if that school district makes the wrong choice about which math program to pick and they bungle the implementation it's very unlikely that there will be specific consequences for the people involved. The kids can't generally just go to a different school. Um, and so if I were to give a, a state of union on ed tech today, I would say that education has changed more in the last 20 years than it has in the previous thousand. And we are in the midst of a massive transformation that requires our institutions to change in ways that are not easy. To begin with, it used to be that you needed five things to run a school district, competencies in five things. Secure, building a building, <laughs> hiring and managing teachers, getting lunch, buses, and textbooks. That's it. If you could do those five things, you could run a school. Now, there's more than 10,000 ed tech products on the market, and every school is expected to make high stakes decisions about which of those 10,000 products they should buy and how to implement them, which combination of things, which things are too ambitious, how ready are they? I will note, I will note that that exact point, um, I, I recorded an episode of the Learning Can't Wait podcast with Christina Ishmael, the Deputy Director of the Office of Ed Tech um, or Educational Technology, I want to abbreviate, give it, the, give it the respect it deserves. And that mm -hmm. exact point was one of the main reasons Christina named that a lot of spending has not occurred that needs to have occurred, is there's just this overwhelming influx of decisions that have to be made about spending. Um, and there's issues with, you know, um, uh, back ordering and production that has caused challenges with like tools that improve HVAC systems, devices, mm -hmm. hardwiring. But then this huge number of ed tech products available poses challenges um, on ed tech spending. So there's mm -hmm. a kind of point that you're making here about where we are that that she made as well. It's hugely important. I mean. An analogy that I would use is, you know, imagine that in the old days you were, you know, fighting a dragon and you had a sword and that's it. You have a sword. You got no choice. You got no armor. You got no protection. You just run out. You do your best. Now, suddenly you hear that a dragon is coming and you go into a room and there's a thousand different things. There's 40 different swords. There's different boots and shoes and shields and uh, you know, and water barriers and magic spells. And you're like, oh. fatigue, just listening to this. Yeah, uh, it, it's very common to have what I call paralysis by analysis. Mm -hmm. In part because you feel the fear that if you screw it up, it's your fault. Yes, yes. And um, I'm listening to a great book called Stolen Focus. Uh, right now, in which the author talks about 
uh, the concept of cruel optimism, uh, which is when a system is broken in ways that can't be solved by an individual, but someone pitches a solution that makes the individual think it's easy. And you see this uh, in fad diets and things on the internet, like this one trick to reducing belly fat, right? There is no one trick to reducing belly fat. And there is no one silver bullet ed tech product that is going to magically make sense of your entire world and help you understand what to do. And this is a systemic problem. It used to be that there was only one ed tech product, a CD-ROM encyclopedia. <laughs> you remember, do you remember that? Of course I do. <laughs> and the only decision was, do you want the Growers or Encarta? We had Encarta at my okay. house. Okay. And uh, <laughs> yeah. And either one was pretty good. But now schools have to decide do I want a math program that has these eight features? Does it tie into my learning management system? How much planning time does it require? It's not apples to apples. This is not like going into an auto parts store and saying, I need a headlight for a 1998 Oldsmobile Cutlass, right? Because almost every product claims to do multiple things and educators just don't have time to figure out which claims are accurate, how well different things work, and they don't have the incentive or the time or the money to study these things themselves. So without going too much further into this, I'll say that our nation's 13,000 or so school districts are trapped right now in what economists would call a collective action problem. And that is when everyone would benefit if someone would do something, but no one has the incentive to do it. Everyone has an incentive to free ride off of others. Classic example of this is plowing the streets after there's been two feet of snow. Imagine there's no government and we get two feet of snow. All of us would like the streets to be plowed, but none of us has the incentive to buy an $800,000 snow plow to plow the streets for everybody else. That is a perfect case where government solves a collective action problem. And right now we need somebody and that somebody is almost certainly the federal government to solve this collective action problem to help our schools understand which technologies are appropriate for which contexts and which use cases and which of them are effective under what circumstances for which populations. So I'd be remiss if we didn't dive right into the recent Omnibus Act, which includes funding for a kind of DARPA for education, which I know you know a little bit about. So how, how close does that get us towards the collective purchase of the snowplow? Well, I would say it's the functional equivalent of finally buying a piece of paper and writing on it someone needs to buy a snowplow. Oh, <laughs> it is a very, very small but important step. DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, exists to invest in technologies that can hopefully help with national defense. It is a well-funded, well-run agency that has a mission of driving innovation in defense. It takes risks. It funds things that are sound crazy. I mean, I don't have a list of the types of things they funded, but I suspect it includes things like robots that are shaped like little spiders that can crawl around and you know, sonic barriers that can you know, block projectiles. I mean, they fund a lot of things to try to figure out how to advance defense. 
And in education, we do none of that. Um, the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Center, I think we, we collectively spend more than $40 billion a year on basic research and development and innovation there. The same thing with NASA and aerospace. Right now in education, if you round it to the nearest billion, we spend zero billion on education innovation, and we need it desperately. We need to understand how can we better assess our students? For example, as a teacher and a, and a building leader, you know how useless it is to you to get the results of a state test months later. When the kids are not even in school and the regression that occurs in the summer makes it basically baseless and unimportant by the time they come back in September. Yes. Exactly. And now well. imagine that we can find ways to assess kids in a formative manner while they're doing their learning every day to take little snapshots of their understanding understand which principles and concepts they've mastered and which ones they're still struggling with. If we can get assessment right, we can make tremendous progress in adapting our teaching to meet the needs of those kids so that they don't need to fall behind in the first place. But the private market right now is already getting paid to provide assessments. So if assessment companies are selling you know, a billion dollars a year of assessments, I'll just make up a number, should they invest $5 billion in trying to create the assessments of tomorrow if they will only be able to collect a billion dollars a year for a better product? Maybe, maybe some assessments are would be so worth it that a company would want to invest in the hope they could take the market away but the reality is it hasn't happened yet we don't see that type of basic science work happening in education companies in part because of the incentives and in part because of the scale this is where we need the federal government to invest in basic science r d and the $40 million in the Omnibus Act to have the uh, to have IES, it isn't enough for them to create a new center, which is really the bare minimum we need. And I think that costs about $100 million. But even the $100 million is just a drop in the bucket. We need funding for NSF and the Department of Ed to, to run rigorous competitions to give grants to universities and to for-profits and to nonprofits to come up with the innovations of tomorrow, whether they be in assessment, adaptivity, augmented reality, or 20 other things that you and I can't think of yet. We need them and we need them now. And the reason we don't have them uh, is twofold. The first is we once again have a collective action problem. As a teacher, you would probably love to have that type of assessment, but you don't have an incentive to spend 10 hours a week lobbying Congress. <laughs> and if you don't have that time, neither do any of your peers. And as a result, it doesn't happen because there is no voice that is beating the drum saying we need this. And that's a big problem. And the other problem is that many people, I, I'd hazard a guess that a majority of people in the country think of education as a local matter. They say, I don't want the federal government in my business. And they fundamentally misunderstand that the federal government can play several different roles. While it's true that the federal government can play one role as a regulator enforcing civil rights laws and disabilities laws and setting minimum standards for 
IEPs and other things of that nature, the federal government also in different parts of our economy plays the role of a neutral information aggregator. And my favorite example there is the National Weather Service. The National Weather Service run by our federal government saves us all a tremendous amount of time by collecting weather data from tens of thousands of stations a day and operating weather satellites, which none of us can afford to operate ourselves yet, and then aggregating that information, analyzing it, and pushing it out to friends like my young meteorologist who then use it to make local forecasts. The federal government doesn't decide what the weather is going to be, but it collects the information. And we need the equivalent of the National Weather Service for education technology. We need the federal government to support an effort to collect information about what our schools are using, how is it performing, and how that performance varies from school to school. I don't know if your show includes notes that your listeners could check out, but I can give you a link to a two-minute video on this topic that my team and I recently made, and hopefully will start to change some hearts and minds. Well, it's clearly a question that's on a lot of folks' minds. One, one, the media is paying attention now more than I've ever seen before to this, than this notion that we are inundated with tools and really have no idea of the efficacy or impact that they have on a local level, right? Really on a specific school individualized level. But you're naming this really important type of oversight that we see in other parts of the U.S. government, but we don't see here. And I, I read an article the other day that talked about just how we as a society approach education, view education, and how it differs fundamentally from how we approach and view pretty much every other aspect of our life. And I think you made that abundantly clear with the myriad examples you just shared here of regulation that exists elsewhere, but not in a space that is pretty vital to how students learn and how our society evolves. You know, I, I am curious, I have a little bit of a Hamilton joke, but you were you were in the room where it happened, it being online learning. And I, with the time we have remaining, want to dive into that a little bit. Talk to our listeners and to me about how schools received online learning at its inception. Yes, the room where it happened. It was really fascinating to be part of the first wave of introducing schools and libraries where a lot of learning happens um, to education of any kind being provided synchronously online. When we first went to schools with the idea of providing online instruction, many of them dismissed it out of hand. Um, we were offering tutoring. And many schools, most schools said, tutoring is not our job. Our job is um, teaching. And we teach a, a class that is uh, full of kids. And once they leave the room, it's the responsibility of parents and families to help them with their homework. And over time, that attitude has, of course, changed dramatically in many places, because after, as a former math teacher, when I would teach a quadratic equation and I'd send my kids home, they go home to 30 different, wildly different environments. Some of them go to a house with two parents, an older sibling. They don't have to work. They have support while other kids go home to an apartment with a single parent who has two jobs and the kid has to take care of a younger sibling. And the next day when they all come back to school, inequality has made itself apparent. And so schools are now seeing that if they provide high intensity tutoring and homework help, it can make the learning experience better for everybody because 
variability is the enemy of instruction. I can't teach the quadratic equation to a class full of kids when five of them don't remember how to do square roots. Three of them don't know how to factor polynomials. It slows everybody down. If everybody can stay on track, then the entire class can make progress. And schools are starting to see that, unfortunately, from the results of the pandemic, which really exacerbated and shined a bright light on these inequalities. It used to be that school districts had, even in school districts that had one-to-one -one devices, something like 30% of kids never used them. They didn't even set them up. And when the pandemic started, they had no choice, schools, but to figure out what does it take to actually get this kid using the technology successfully. It's not enough to just hand somebody a laptop or a laptop and a little mobile internet device if there's nobody at home who knows how to use them and can provide support. So it's been really heartwarming to see in the last few years, almost every school district investing in the capability of providing a minimum level of support to every family so that they can get online, they can get connected, and they can get support. That doesn't mean that they know how to use the particular programs or they work, but we've made tremendous progress on that front. Probably very different as you're naming than the initial experience of online learning being introduced into schools. What challenges did you face upon that initial introduction that you weren't prepared for? A good question. Uh, I'd say one of the biggest ones was a lack of budget lines. Uh, I remember when we were selling online tutoring to public libraries where a lot of kids would go after school who didn't have any place else to go, librarians were interested in using the computers that were at the time sitting mostly unused uh, to provide tutoring support but they didn't have a, a line item for tutoring. <laughs> and so they had to cobble together money from periodicals and copy paper and other things. And, you know, there was a time when nobody had light bulbs, right? And the first people who went out had to sell light bulbs and convince them, their customers. And now, of course, we everybody has line items for electricity and light bulbs and uh, another thing is the technology back then was not really ready to provide high bandwidth support. There was no e-commerce. There was no encryption. Um, it, you know, there was no way to monitor sessions and and you know confirm quality. There was a lot of a lot of things taken on faith. But we've made progress in so many of those things now that it's possible from a technical standpoint for any student and any teacher anywhere in the country to connect either individually or in groups with the support of live real-time content and video and games and drills. And we're in, the, we're in the most exciting phase, I think, of the ed tech revolution, which is we now have what we need to do it right. And it's time to assemble all the pieces and build the systems and the processes to provide the teachers and the students with the support they need. Because as you like to say, learning can't wait. <laughs> yeah, no, for, you know, Bart, I talk so much about the ripe opportunity we have now that we've laid the infrastructure for all types of learning to occur without geographic boundaries, without the limit of uh, what resources exist within one school district in one location. It is an opportunity. There's an opportunity ahead of us for systemic redesign of education with allowing students and allowing teachers more resources than ever existed before to address some of these major, major issues that 
didn't exist, didn't grow out of the pandemic. They existed before, but they were exacerbated by the pandemic. Very true. We're, we're really like wrapped on time right now. So I'm going to like throw in my last question and just like for the audience and the listeners know that we're going to get back to this. We're going to come back or do another episode with Bart as long as he agrees to that. As long as that was going to be enough fun um, to talk about some of the other issues in a little bit more depth. But, you know, our closing question typically asks for advice uh, you would give to a teacher starting their career. So I'm wondering what advice you would share. Sure. It's a great question. And I would say... The advice is similar to the advice that we give to our students today. When we tell them the most important thing is learning how to learn. The jobs that will exist 20 years from now, they probably don't exist. Who knows what they'll be? Low gravity, artificial intelligence. Um, I can't even make things up. Big question mark. The, the, right? Technology is unquestionably now a part of education, just like it is almost every other industry. There's a joke in the world of aviation that, say, that goes as follows. What does it take to fly a modern jet? You need two things. You need a pilot and you need a dog. And the dog's job is to bite the pilot's hand if she tries to touch anything. <laughs> because there's so much technology and automation yeah, right. and it's crucial for pilots to understand every last switch and button and system and process in the plane for safety to make it work for them and in education i'd say it's the exact same more technology is coming it can either frighten frustrate and exacerbate you or it can support and empower and free you to be the best teacher that you can. And the way you get the latter is by being the master of the technology, by embracing it, figuring out which things you like, and pushing those around you to do it properly. And by do, do it properly, I mean a few things that are really, really important. First, the work of the EdTech Genome Project shows that teacher agency is extremely important in the selection of technology. Leaders, do not just pick things and drop them on your teachers. It will frustrate them. They will not use it. They will be feeling disrespected. Involve the teachers. Find out what their needs are. Let them be involved with testing different products, piloting them, and then helping to choose. Make sure that happens in your environment. Second, quantity is not quality. In general, my recommendation to every school in the country would be to reduce the number of ed tech products that they have by 50% and increase the amount of training they do on the remaining products by 100%. Fewer things done better probably yield much improved results and lower stress for everybody. And the third thing is demand evidence. Demand evidence of efficacy and of fit. And this doesn't mean that you as a new teacher need to have a degree in statistics or research methods, it can be just as simple as going to faculty meetings and saying, what's the evidence that this product works for anybody? What's the evidence this product works with students like ours? Right now, in many schools, they buy millions of dollars of products and nobody ever asked that question. If a hundred teachers ask that question, the administration will have no choice but to ask the vendors for their proof. And what we hear from the vendors over and over again is they do what sells. If doing research and proving their efficacy was the best way to sell, 
they would do it. And right now, it mostly isn't. What makes the most sense for most companies is to invest in user experience, marketing, social media, hiring former school superintendents, marketing and branding. Those things generate leads and sales. If we collectively want change, we all need to encourage each other to ask for evidence and we'll get more of it. Oof, that's quite the call to action. I love it. It is a wonderful place to pause for today. Bart, I am so grateful you came on the podcast today. Thank you so much for giving us a slice into some of the important things that have threaded through your career, but also driven you forward and really the call to action you have for our society as we think about education technology moving forward. It's been a pleasure, Haley. I'm so inspired by your podcast and your work, and I really look forward to continuing the conversation. And thank you, anybody who listened all the way to the end. I appreciate you. (laughs) (laughs) And there'll be more, part two, coming soon. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Thanks for listening to the Learning Can't Wait podcast. If you liked what you heard, please rate, review, and share this episode. Be the first to know when we have a new episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or have a suggestion for an episode, email us at podcast at itutor.com. Grow your teaching staff with just one click. iTutor partners with state licensed teachers from across the U.S. to help schools provide additional instruction to students. Whether you need them part-time or full-time, our educators are standing by to get you started right away. Head to iTutor.com to learn more.